thank you. Well, I'm extremely honoured to be here. Um, I was actually a human scientist here about 30 years ago, and I've only been back in it sort of a couple of times since. And boy, is it beautiful. I'm missing out in Cambridge. It is just an afternoon like this afternoon. It's just really lovely. Um, uh, I want to mention that um, I've been stuck in bed with flu for the last three days, and I actually levered myself off my deathbed. It was quite a handy deadline to actually turn up and, and do this. But it, if I pause and look blankly at you once or twice this afternoon, it's because I'm trying to extrude some ideas out of um, my kind of jelly-like body this afternoon. And, um, so yes, be, uh, be kind, please. Um, I think I'm going to be talking uh, deliberately multidisciplinary today. Um, I just wanted to get a quick show of hands for those uh, from those for whom the notion of Web 2.0 is something they're kind of familiar with. Okay, so about, I don't know, 60%, something like that. Okay, um, my, my own work, um, uh, as Jeannie had mentioned, um, spans a number of disciplines. I come from a business school. Um, I, I write in sort of in the critical tradition, sometimes business school, so I bring some sort of organisational kind of science uh, interest, in particular in notions of emergence, which is going to come through in some of what I'm talking about here. Um, I've written about the impact of open standards, particularly on public service, um, uh, open standards and open architectures in evol evolving public services in the UK, and I've had some involvement as a cabinet office advisor over the last two or three years um, in doing that, and I'm going to draw kind of heavily on some of that stuff uh, as well, and I have written in the past on ICT for D. Um, I did a master's in, in development studies at SOAS a number of years ago. Um, I don't claim to be an expert, uh, the kind of go-to expert in any of these fields. So I guess what I try and do is uh, write observations based on pulling some of these disciplines and experiences together. And I'm very, very aware that there are some people here who are specialists, for example, in African studies, uh, specialists in Web 2.0 behaviours themselves. Um, and, and I guess I'm offering, the, offering these observations humbly uh, in that kind of knowledge and understanding. So um, I guess I kind of depart um, from a kind of irresistible poem, or ditty, quoted by Robert Chambers in what I think is a fantastic um, IDS paper produced, I think it was in 20, 2010. Um, World Bank, highest of us all, looks down to see poor people, small like atoms, all the same size, of size of which is right, to standardise. Now I'm deliberately starting with that because um, I think what he's picking up here is, is a traditional association of the notion of standardisation with top-down, very traditional, um, integrated forms of organisational control, of which, of course, the World Bank has been seen as a, as, a, as a classic exemplar. In other words, Taylorian, top-down, um, sort of representationist, vertically integrated institutions um, that thrive on standardisation of those, those whom they, um, well, many would claim, um, subjectify. So there is an association there that I think, in, in particular, my own interest in the future for ICT for D um, offers a real opportunity to, to, to overturn. Uh, and I'm hopefully going to end with my own research question at the moment going forward, which is, which is to try and st turn, to turn that on its head. I'm going to try and, and um, uh, divide uh, this talk into four kind of sections. First of all, I'm going to try and locate what I uh, mean by development, and, and I guess and, and, uh, we can sort of unpack some of that uh, maybe later on. Um, but I think uh, I, I come at the notion of development with a kind of deliberately critical um, uh, spin, I think, so I need to say something about that and say something about the role of ICT within development as well, um, because I think it is increasingly disruptive in its opportunity, which I, which I welcome as a positive thing. I'm then going to move into the notion of open ICT for D. There's a lot of open stuff, open talk around. Um, I've had quite a lot of involvement with, with this government. I'm not politically aligned, I hasten to add, but... Um, I'm a great believer in open, so I'm going to try and explain what I mean by that. Um, and I'm going to kind of pay a little bit of lip service to some of the, some of the fantastic um, Web 2.0 activities that are currently going on um, all over uh, emerging economies. So I'm going to talk about some of those. So I, I regard those as a kind of data applications and infrastructure type of activities. Uh, and PESA might be an example. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but mainly to locate my position in relation to what I want to talk about or to major in which is a massive opportunity for ICT for D, which I don't think anybody, and by, by, by anybody I mean anybody in ICT for D, is yet addressing. And I'm going to um, offer some uh, observations based on my own experience working at the Cabinet Office in the UK, um, addressing the notion of open architecture in the UK. And then uh, finally, I'm going to try and take some of those observations and try and kind of draw some potential conclusions or open research questions for the development and, and ICT for D community. So as you can see, it's a little bit wide ranging. It's probably vastly over ambitious and I'm going to fall flat on my face, but let, here goes and let's, uh, let's see what happens. 
So to address the first um, uh, first section, I guess um, everyone in this room will be familiar with that. So I'm sure there's umpteen critiques have turned on its head, and, and it's, it's no longer acceptable to put it up. It did have enormous impact on me when I first came came across this book. Um, cut it in half, and of course it says Foucault right, right the way through the middle of it. Um, and in particular, it's obviously about the production of the developed um, within within webs of discourse, if you like, that frame those people as legitimate objects of knowledge and targets of power under the rational gaze of development experts. So that's pretty much, that had enormous impact on me back in, back in my SOAS days. Um, and in particular, I think it's, yes, there, there's the Foucault element of it. I think Side's, um, Side's notion of Orientalism was something that also kind of... Uh, I guess none of this stuff is radical anymore at all, is it? But I felt I was being very radical at the time reading this stuff, electrified by it. Um, but, I, but I think, I, I guess the, the point is for me, is that I feel that those people who engage in a highly uneven um, uh, topographical terrain of development in which, uh, in which their business, their meat and drink, if you like, is problematizing <coughs> um, and, and, and being activists around the notion of inequality yeah, I, for me, I, I feel that they are participating in, in, in a highly contested discourse in which it is incumbent upon anybody, really, to be, to be radical. In other words, to, be, to engage in development, for me, is to seek radical transformation in the fortunes um, of, of those who are being developed, for that is the purpose of development. It is not, for me, the replication of a normative set of relations um, with, with maybe Bretton Woods institutions and, and top-down top northern donors, etc. And of course, we've seen great strides in, in, in the transition of agency towards uh, southern, um, you know, southern NGOs, etc. And, and, and the world has moved on. I fully accept all of that, although I believe that many of the fundamental underlying structures still obtain, and therefore I think there are um, uh, continuing opportunities for ICT to play a role. But, the, but for ICT itself, having, having kind of given, offered a, a view of development, I think ICT, and as, as I've written in the past, I think it forms, forms two kind of high-level uh, roles really within development. Number one, it mediates developmental discourse, I'll explain what I mean. And two, I think it, it, it increasingly crowds out and competes with other forms of development spending and activity and is, thus has to stand up, if you like, in its own kind of business case, in its own right, um, in competition with those things. In, uh, in 2005, um, I wrote a, a paper for Review of African Political Economy, which, which had a crack at um, James D. Wolfenson, the then president of the World Bank, because he came to Cambridge when I was doing my PhD, uh, and he made a, a speech about uh, the then World Bank Development Gateway, and um, we'll dive into that in a second, have a quick peek. Um, it was unproblematically unpro presented, I think, as a knowledge, gra a knowledge grab, if you like, and a land grab for knowledge. He, he said... The World Bank has been the World Bank for the last 30, 40 years. Uh, now there is an opportunity to, to have a kind of normalising portal, although he didn't call it that. And he said, we can now become the knowledge bank for the world. And um, the way in which that was presented, um, I found particularly problematic and did a discourse analysis on him. Um, but also it got me into looking at um, the role uh, at the time of ICT as mediator of both that discourse and development. So I think Manuel Castells, who presents here quite regularly, has talked about ICT's uh, almost binary capability of integrating people into networks um, or, or excluding them from networks. And I think his point was that a, a poor person in, I don't know, um, one of the old cotton milled towns um, in Lancashire in the UK, if excluded from that network, was, was pretty much just as, just as switched off as, as, I don't know, some, um, some uh, rural poor in Ghana, for example. In other words, um, the kind of binary Networking topography was increasingly replacing geographical traditional topographies of north, south, etc. Um, uh, within within networks. So, so um, ICT's capability of integrating people into uneven networks of power at a global level was was starting to redraw maps. I think increasingly, some people may recognise that logo. That's the one laptop per child logo. Again, started off great fanfare. We can deliver all these laptops for under hundred dollars. Um, uh, I think it's, it's subsequently being called into question, in particular, the, the large level of spend that this is, um, this is maybe diverted from other, um, other causes. Um, I just wanted to have a quick look at uh, the, the development gateway to show you what I mean. Um, those of you who may not have seen it, launched by the World Bank um, about, I don't know, 12 years ago or something like that. Um, it, the World Bank has now distanced itself from the gateway, but make no mistake, but we'll see what that's about. I think increasingly ICT is also, via portal technologies, starting to shape uh, the art of the possible. In other words, the way people conceive of and apply for and frame development opportunities. Let's see if we can open this thing up. So, 
here is the development gateway. All sorts of um, oh look, got fantasy football there and, and all sorts of other diversions. There are all sorts of very worthy things if you look at the gateway, but what really, what really exercises me is this little thing buried down here, development gateway market. So let's go and have a look at that because there's much, much more content in the development gateway market, it appears, than anywhere else in the development gateway. And once again, underneath the kind of wholesome picture here, it's, the content is once again buried through a link. We click on that and we start to see really what the development gateway is all about. So you can see here the vast number of live procurement opportunities to spend uh, billions and billions and billions of developmental dollars. Um, and, and we can see actually that this is a vast trading marketplace. Now what, what, I, what I kind of hold up, I suppose, is for, for scrutiny and examination is the extent to which this sort of portal, this sort of ICT for D, actually uh, extends those sort of relations of, of, of control and discursive uh, uh, kind of normalization that Escobar was, was questioning, um, or whether it actually threatens them. And my, 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 what I would offer for you is, is that I don't, I don't see anything particularly radical or certainly not transformatory uh, in, 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 in what's going on here. So I'm a critic of it. I'm still a critic of it. Um, I don't think they've got it right, uh, and, it, and it worries me. So just back to, back to this. So those are macro-level observations I made back in um, 2005. Micro level, I think people like Ronda Wolikowski um, in the ICT community have commented on the notion of software as frozen discourse, and certainly there are one or two case studies about, for example, early release of, of, of computers that, that had the wrong letters on keyboards and, and, and didn't facilitate um, the, uh, the ability of many people from different cultures to actually interact properly with the software. And indeed, at the micro level, the unfolding kind of level of emergence, ICT's role in classifying, ordering, and structuring reality. So again, one other link, I'm not going to do a lot of this linking, but I just wanted to show you this, which has knocked me out, I think. It's been around for quite a few years. Um, Zalendo, which is, I think, the eye on, Ke eye on Kenyan parliament. I spent a, a year, um, funny enough, when I finished being a human science student here as an English teacher in Kenya many years ago. Um, so in 1987, eight or something, Back then, I think there were a couple of state media, there was Kenya Times, and then there was the Daily Nation. Um, most of those things were full of um, recent Harambe sort of politician donations to schools and long rambling speeches. <laughs> um, uh, there was obviously Kanu, the, the, the one-party state back then. Um, very, very different. It was impossible, really, to criticise or to find any sort of uh, media to support any... Um, uh, any democratic activity of the sort that you can see here. And this is utterly extraordinary, really, how all the presidential debates influence your vote. You can check out your MPs, you can comment on them, you can see, um, you can see uh, what they've been up to recently. Um, uh, you can see, you, you can, I think there are forums somewhere here where you can actually look at, you can actually discuss um, the C word, corruption. Um, it's an extraordinary thing. And, and I think it's tempting sometimes, because these things are buried on the internet, to really, to really kind of, to not, to, to, to step back and have a look at quite how these things have altered the structuring of, of social reality, because in that particular instance, it's massive. Um, I then did some stuff um, uh, in 2008. Um, I, I don't know whether I got to the phrase 2.0 for Richard Heeks, who is absolutely the ICT for D expert in, in, in this country, and certainly not me. Um, but we kind of we kind of arrived about about the same time. Um, but I wrote something. I guess it was looking at some of the emerging Web 2 forms um, and. Um, uh, and uh, at there, and wanted to kind of interrogate, if you like, its impact, potential impact on the development community. Um, and um, and I went down and um, presented at the IDS in, in Brighton, and I can't remember, it's a mainstream development journal, and I can't remember what it, what it was now. Um, uh, point being, I think that, that uh, at the time I articulated kind of four raging debates within development, and again, um, I guess it's, it's, it's kind of four or five years old now, so there may be some other ones that, that are now no longer addressed here, but participation, obviously, the Cook and Cathari book in 2001, bemoaning, if you like, the, the way in which the noble notion of participation had become progressively co-opted into a kind of box-ticking exercise, and so I think development has been wringing its hands about that issue for some time. Um, and I think there are particular ways in which ICT for D could help people to overcome some of those kind of groupthink and institutional kind of pressures um, that were serving to constrain um, real participation. So, you know, uh, in particular, I'm talking about gender here, uh, but I'm also talking about um, kind of uh, you know um, uh, political camps and and and, um, and all, all sorts of all sorts of local circumstances which are eliminated by ICT for D. Um, I think there was, there was, I argue that there was an opportunity for ICT for D to contribute to um, the critical modernist um, kind of, I guess that's the notion of Habermasian um, um, 
uh, dialogue leading to kind of greater uh, or, or, or closer approach to, to a, a kind of truth. Um, and again, I think um, the kind of wikiing and blogging and Web 2.0 style activities, in particular audit trails that show the development of arguments for all to consult and that cannot be eliminated and gone back on, could potentially play a, a big role there. The new clinical economics, I guess I'm thinking about um, um, uh, Easterby's white, white, white man's burden. So again, the idea of the kind of cathedral and the bizarre metaphor, uh, the notion that, um, that ICT4D um, provided potential for platforms to, to really challenge top-down notions of development, statist notions of development, the command economy approach, if you like. Um, and, and I think there are all sorts of ways to explore that. Uh, and finally, the new institutional theory kind of approach, which has borrowed uh, quite a lot from organization studies, which sees institutions ontologically, if you like, as, as inhering and as comprising the ongoing activities of their participants rather than the great top-down uh, tailoring organizations, the theme to which I'm going to return uh, in a minute. Um, I'm thinking maybe, for example, more in 2002, who writes about um, the, the, you know, if, if a developmentalist can harness some of this, okay, then, and, and, and really involve or articulate citizens in the ongoing um, operation of the state, then obviously the notions of state legitimacy um, are, are, are addressed uh, perhaps more easily. Got to keep moving on because I'm conscious that this is sort of just positioning uh, material here. Um, in 2010, I did a um, paper with Jeff Walsh, it's the last thing I've, I've foray into ict but I'm probably kind of overdue another another think about it, and this has been tremendously helpful, this invitation um, today, to kind of hopefully try and get my thoughts together for the next next stage, as it were. Um, what we did is, is say that, look, all of this opportunity for ict for d to engage in a number of, across a number of dimensions with truly uh, participatory and transformatory development aims, um, of, of, with development conceived as I've described, call for a much more strategically transformatory focus um, within ICT4D. And we did a quite exhaustive review of the literature in ICT4D in Africa, concluding that much of it was about kind of point implementations of technology. So in-depth studies of, I don't know, it might be a, um, might be a uh, implementation of an um, ERP system in a bank in, in Nigeria, for example. But that's actually asking about the, 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 the outcome of uh, of some of these implementations of ICT4D uh, developmentally. So I think there is still within ICT4D a, a rather unfocused um, engagement with what it is developmentally that we're all trying to achieve. Um, and I think there is, there is um, some focus, I think some scope for sharpening up some of those aims when we actually approach the field. And we offered here, um, uh, I think, four for particular enablers or ways in which ICT could act as enablers. So for institutional growth, governance, accountability, service production, economic activity, and the kind of Castellian, if you like, access to global markets uh, and resources. Not going to plunge into that, but I'm um, happy to provide anybody uh, with references. But I certainly think there is a really strategic opportunity um, that we're not necessarily um, taking advantage of here. Um, and I mentioned um, in, 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 um, in passing also that I think uh, before we all rush in enthusiastically, I think there is a, a danger of naivety here, of course, um, and sometimes I get wildly enthusiastic myself about these things. I think there is a, re a real need for, for um, development studies to interrogate ICT as well. I think certainly if you look at the behaviours of large multinational corporations such as, for example, Cisco, um, who are piling into... Um, uh, planning to developing economies because, of course, many of their, their domestic markets are saturated. Um, there, is, there is a real danger that ICT could be a Trojan horse for some management practices that we wouldn't necessarily wish to see in our own countries. Um, uh, and, and in particular, I think that's mirrored in, in, in what's sometimes called the new philanthropy. So I'm talking about, for example, Gates Foundation. In other words, this notion that we can bypass some of those uh, you know, that, that kind of impatience or frustration with traditional development structures, some of the Bretton Woods institutions, some of the NGOs, some of the funding bodies, and just cut straight to the chase and, and import some successful business practices, typically um, uh, neoliberal, quite North American focused business practices, straight into, straight into developing country contexts without necessarily pausing to consider some of the lessons that, that it, the aid industry, for all its, its tremendous faults, has learned over the years. So I think there is a, a note of caution to be sounded there. And as ev evidence for that, the development gateway itself, um, in fact, um, shortly after uh, it was launched on the world, was, was hugely criticized um, by some of the South African trade unions, who pretty much, um, pretty much nailed it, I think, in, in my opinion. Its true intention is to control the development information discourse to promote its own particular perspectives. So I'm talking about 
a lot of optimism here, a lot of strategic opportunity for ICT for D to really re help development to reframe some of its current issues, but I'm also talking about the need for a political economy of that um, and, and not to be naive. And in particular, I would emphasize the notion of development as, I don't know who, how many people are familiar with the Sinofin framework. No, not, probably not many. I'm not, not seeing too many nods. Okay, I'll take you very, very briefly. There's a notion here of four, uh, four types of, of, of research environment or, or social reality, if you like, or sorry, physical and social reality. Simple is cause and effect. So if I flick a, if I flick a switch, the light comes on. Okay, it's a pretty, pretty um, binary thing. I do, do, do thing A and thing B happens. Okay. Often, however, of course, um, uh, particularly in the world of engineering, okay, but again in the world of physical science, we can talk about complicated uh, relationships. So, for example, when I enter a skyscraper, I'm pretty keen that the structural engineers and architects have worked through all the possible combinations of stress and wind and heat and, and weight distribution, etc., so that the thing doesn't fall over. Those are vastly complex beyond my ability to map, but somebody has mapped them. Okay? They are knowable. That's the point. They are knowable. They may be complicated, but they're knowable. Okay, so again, dependency relationships there. Um, however, the social world, and in particular the organizational world, I think has, has, has really made tremendous strides in becoming much less naive over the last 20 or 30 years, um, most notably in the development of practice theory, sees the world as complex, which is basically unknowable. In other words, when we go into a particular situation, the dynamics surrounding that situation cannot however complicated, be mapped in advance because they emerge out of that situation. And I'm going to be diving into some more detailed examples of that a bit later. So I think development for me has started to make tremendous strides towards the acknowledgement of the more complex nature, social nature of, of, of unfolding social reality and to stop effectively pretending that we can know and map development and development projects as, as merely complicated. Um, and, and old Peterson was talking about this quite a while ago. You can see on the left-hand side some of the more traditional Eurocentric, representationalist, entitative conceptions of development. And you can see, uh, again, um, uh, the sort of actor orientation that Ark and Long and others have been arg arguing for, for for many years. I don't want to dwell on that too much, though, because I think this, for me, if I can point you back towards the IDS paper by Robert Chambers, it's up there on the web, um, once more, is, is a tremendous encapsulation of that priors and commitments. In other words, if you look at the top here, we've got some of the more traditional kind of orientations of development here, and at the ontological level, I think that, he, that, that um, Chambers would argue there was a preconception of things, with physicality, with Newtonian science, with order, with the ability to map things. Um, and we can see as we go down um, what, what some of the kind of more pragmatic, practical implications, commitments, if you like, of that have been. Um, towards hierarchies and, and, and log frame analysis, the traditional kind of World Bank uh, method of approaching development. And we can see what Chambers calls adaptive pluralism. So part of that, because I'm going to come back to adaptive pluralism in a second, which are pretty much the opposite of that. And again, I'm not going to plow through all of those, but I just want to give you a flavor of this shift in, in, in many development thinkers' um, um, minds of the whole paradigm of development, which embraces much more emergence and, and complexity. Okay? Uh, and the implications of that. And I genuinely believe that ICC for D, in a very open sense, is able to turbocharge this process. Okay, so this is this is ICT's challenge back again to development studies, and that's what I want to talk about. So I think uh, we're, we're seeing all sorts of. Uh, so I, I will try and try and um, define open, give you a working definition of open. I would define it in I defined it in the twenty two thousand five paper as a technical and social shift to peer to peer models interaction. I, believe the technology is probably the least important part of this and certainly the least challenging part of this. It's all about the social. However, there are some purely technical components to this, of course, open APIs, um, XML, uh, wrappering, interoperability, open standards. Again, I'm not going to kind of uh, dwell too much on those, but they are there and they have changed. That landscape has absolutely changed in the last 10 years. You couldn't do some of the things now that you could do, sorry, then, that you can do now. Um, and as a result, we have seen, obviously, this explosion to peer, in peer-to-peer -peer wiki-based types of social uh, interaction. So I'm, I'm going to kind of have a crack at defining open, uh, working definition of open in this context as a paradigm for technology-enabled social life, characterized by diversity, collaboration, and multiple truths. And therefore, I think it has truly transformatory potential, particularly to address, of course, the adaptive pluralism kind of uh, notions that Chambers is reaching for here. Um, 
but which, which in, in uh, let's face it, in, in the great majority of developmental contexts doesn't yet exist and is, and is very, is very ill-supported. So do you publish these presentations? Yes. Uh, I believe it's being filmed at the moment. There is yeah. video. Yeah. It'll be webcast and it'll be on the OII's website right. in a few weeks. You don't have the scribble very fast. You don't have the scribble So it, it is quite quick. I'm, I, I accept that. Um, just before we leave um, this, this part of the presentation, I just want to throw up a couple of other definitions to be, to be quite as clear as we possibly can. This is what I mean by Web 2.0. This is Tim O'Reilly, who defined the term in 2005, so I think we can probably uh, run with his definition. Um, delivering software is a continually updated service that gets better the more people use it, consuming and remixing data from multiple sources. Okay, so that's a working definition of Web 2.0. I think, again, that's some of the kind of technical stuff, but again, um, the impact that that's had, particularly on public services, I think has been nicely captured by um, Ledbetter and Cotton, 2007. This stuff is absolutely <coughs> out on the web as well, so this is all appropriate enough wiki-based. Um, the notion of the user-generated state. So back in 2007, Ledbetter and Cotton were calling into question okay, some of the, the continued legitimacy of top-down public service delivery in a wiki-enabled Web2 um, enabled world. Okay, so again, um, uh, enlisting users as participants and producers at least some of the time, moving from consumption of content to sharing, rating, ranking, amending, adding. The public sector treats people as consumers, even well treated ones, will miss this dimension of participation. So I think that, that's quite important because we see the emergence of people thinking through the impact of Web 2 behaviours on state legitimacy itself. And again, I think there are some clear parallels between state legitimacy and um, to do with mandates and developmental legitimacy as well. And finally, a final, final um, uh, I, uh, op a definition of open development. This is, this is fairly bleeding hot. Um, there is a book by Matt Smith from IDLC um, and, and Elder, Catherine Elder, um, that came as an edited book, I think it was out last year, uh, called Open Development. Um, and in fact, I know both of those two and some of the people who contributed to it. They've had a crack at defining open development to bring those things together as open social relationships that favour universal over restricted access, universal over restricted participation, and collaboration over centralised production. Okay, so, there, so some people are beginning to think their way and they kind of feel their way towards a notion of open development open ICT for D enabled development and what that means. Okay, so I've, I've covered quite a lot of terrain, I accept that, um, but I think what I wanted to do was to try and draw together some of the kind of, what I see is some of the existing kind of um, debates within development, traditional ways in which ICT for D might be able to thought to address some of those things, um, some of the kind of challenges, if you like, or ways, ways in which each ICT for D and development can interrogate each other, the need for a more strategic um, engagement for people who practice ICT for D in, in, in some of the kind of key debates of development, in particular, uh, what I would see as transformatory potential. Um, uh, and, 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 and finally, to kind of start to hint at um, ways in which ICT for D and the open paradigm may be able to enhance and support developmental attempts at becoming more adaptively plural, which I see, certainly following Chambers, as being um, for me, certainly the most important um, kind of conceptual debate uh, currently raging in development at the moment. Because it's one thing to say we want to be more adaptively plural, one thing to say we want to address the participation issues of the past, and it's quite another thing to actually get out there and do it and support it. And I do see ICT for D as a force um, for the positive in that respect, if used correctly. <coughs> so what I'm going to do now is to give a quick um, run through but not real engagement with, with maybe um, some, of the, some of the things that people might have expected me to, to, to deal with in more depth uh, in this discussion. I'm going to talk about um, uh, some of the kind of examples of Web2 behaviours thus far. And, and, and as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm going to kind of move through those quite quickly, acknowledge them, pay them their respects because they're actually um, hugely important, and move on to the thing that I would, the kind of new territory that I'd like to try and open up. So I'm going to characterise those as data apps and infrastructure. So what do I mean by that? Well, I, I, I'm not going to surprise anybody uh, with, with what I'm going to throw up here. I think, um, I think um, it's, it's pretty obvious from looking, for example, at this, which is a 2013 slide. It's a hackathon. It's being held in South Africa, and it brings together obviously all sorts of hackers from, from across the planet, in fact, but obviously with a particular African focus, to, to doing things themselves. And we've had some, some similar things here in the UK, actually. There was a hackathon, I think, two or three years ago, quite well known, that occurred in, um, uh, uh, in uh, Olympia in London, sponsored by The Guardian, um, where, where people had two days to try and win a couple of, couple of thousand quids worth of a prize to 
pick a state service that costs probably hundreds of millions of pounds to do and to deliver that service in a much more simplified and, and easily accessible format for under £2,000. And, uh, and, and, and uh, small wonder it was, it, was, it was quite successful, actually. Um, this stuff is going on. And note, I think what's interesting about this is there is no World Bank sponsorship. DFID doesn't appear there. None of the usual kind of developmental worthies appear there. These are people getting on with it by themselves. They really couldn't care. Uh, about, about some of these kind of worthies and do-gooders. They're just getting on with it. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a role for worthies and do-gooders, and, and I mean deliberately maybe a little bit, um, uh, a little bit controversial here. But I think, I think the, what is interesting about this is that they are absent. They shout their absence. They're just not there. Um, so I think that's important. I've already talked about Zalendo, so, so again, I think ways, of, ways in which um, um, uh, the political economy is being transformed in, 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 many, uh, in many ways, the governance, um, uh, and I think that, so I talked about that already. I think there are some, in particular, of course, uh, massive ways in which mobile is transforming uh, reality. I'm not going to dive into any one of these in any particular detail. I suppose M-Pesa is the one that, that most people will have heard of, um, and again, very, very quick summary. And PESA is the Kenyan phenomenon of mobile money transfer. Um, it was a, a collaboration initially between Safaricom um, and Vodafone. Um, and uh, currently now, I understand, over 50% of Kenya's GDP goes through this alternative channel. So it, it, really, it really kind of opened eyes because effectively it bypassed um, state distribution mechanisms, so the state banking mechanisms, regulation, um, and was utterly transformatory for, for, for millions and millions of Kenyans who previously either had to pay sort of tithes to banks, if you like, or had to physically transport their money up country from places like Nairobi, uh, a, period, a, a process which often took many days, uh, which again involved intermediaries at every stage. This thing has become absolutely um, uh, critical a part of Kenya's infrastructure and has happened with no initial um, uh, state or, or official involvement whatsoever. It's, it's, it's enormous. I'm not going to, again, not going to dive into it now because that's not the purpose of the talk, but certainly of all of these, this is the most developed in terms of the discussion uh, about, its, about its genuinely transformatory. Uh, capabilities. There are other examples. Uh, Pedigree, for example, offers a mobile-based platform for people to check the provenance of their drugs. So many people have been palmed off with or been buying out-of-date drugs that don't work anymore. And again, you can do that quite quickly. PharmaLine offers a range of opportunities from checking spot prices without being having to rely on intermediaries to tell you these things to uh, to, to planting information about uh, about 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 seeds and all sorts of um, all sorts of agricultural information. Frontline SMS, we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, Frontline SMS is a fantastic messaging uh, collaboration system which, when used in conjunction with local radio, enables people on, on, in local radio to hold debates, live debates, and then to throw those out on the radio and invite people to vote, so to hold kind of um, in real time online polls where people will literally vote by SMS. These votes are collected um, immediately and sorted and aggregated, and in real time, disc jockeys can give, or presenters can give, um, give people, can formulate, if you like, views um, in, in the kind of the live zeitgeist, if you like, um, in real time, which is extraordinary. That speeds up the development of arguments and positions amongst local communities uh, in a visible way that's really never been achieved ever before. Uh, and finally, maybe most impressively for the future, Ushahidi is worth checking out as well. That is a, um, that's a mobile uh, um, online um, um, mapping system, if you like. It allows people very, very quickly to deploy information about whether it's riots, whether it's about election results, whether it's about um, uh, a kind of uh, you know, wars, whether it's about spread of disease. Very, very quickly, people to crowdsource data from all over the place, plot it on the map, and render that visible for everybody so that interventions can be, can be taken control of openly. Um, and again, I think these are, these are all truly transformatory um, uh, uses of ICT for D as opposed maybe to the one I started with, which was the uh, was his development gateway. Um, but again, I, I, need, I need to kind of acknowledge those and the fantastic work that's been done there by many people much better qualified than I to do that and move on to, to the bit that I want to talk about. Just before I do, one or two other um, things that are absolutely happening out there that are very exciting. Um, in the kind of Castellian way, if you like, there's Odesk, and this has been around for a long time, allows economic operators, no matter where they are, to sell their services directly to a global market. Fantastic. And be paid directly through the medium. Okay, again, no reliance on, on intermediaries or, or governments or 
fantastic platform open, of course, to, to anybody who can get connected. And, and this is, this is re quite a mature business model anyway. Finally, final example to flick up, um, our, own, our own DFID here, um, uh, the tail end of last year, this hasn't been released yet, but produced a beta, um, which is an online platform to allow people across the world to drill right the way down into theoretically every pound that the UK state p uh, spends on development projects, and to drill, drill that right the way down to, to some of the governance surrounding delivery of those objectives. So that's quite interesting as well, in terms of transparency and governance. Um, even, even people like not, not even, because I've got a tremendous amount of respect for DFID, but, but more traditional organisations also, I think, are showing now their ability to harness some of these platforms and to, and to, and to, to some, to some you know, positive effect. Okay, so those are some of these obviously things that you might have expected me to talk about in a kind of open ICT for D uh, talk. What I wanted to do now is to talk about what I think is a kind of new space as well, because these things are happening out there. Big question for me is what can we do to catalyze some of those and to act more strategically about, um, about bringing some of these about and making more of these possible? And this is where I want to draw my own experience from the UK government. Um, I um, ended up Purely by chance, I'm not politically aligned as I say, but I wrote a paper in 2007-2008 uh, for George Osborne um, called, called something like um, Open Standards and Open Source, um, and it was about opportunities to transform public services um, uh, through progressive adoption of open standards and open source technologies. Um, one of the one of the key triggers to that, and, and I'm just going to sort of tell you this story now for a few minutes to sort of dive into the kind of UK context, and then we're going to zoom back out at the end for for the moment. One of the key triggers was back in 2007, uh, there had been a situation with which we still kind of were pretty much stuck with today, where there had been a progressive um, transfer of service delivery away from the public sector towards the private sector. There had been um, uh, of a of a 21 to 24 billion UK pounds um, IT public sector IT spend, depending on who you talk to, 80% went to 12 to 14 suppliers. We're talking BT, EDS, HP, um, Fujitsu, Serco, IBM, Accenture, um, and of course you can see what kind of given that 80% market share quite what, 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 um, what uh, motivation many of those suppliers had to change the terrible litany of the delivery of public sector IT projects that we've, that we've languished under. Rural Payments Agency, a classic example, that was by Accenture. Um, I think I gather that cost £450 million and was thrown in a bin. It was scrapped. And that was to process payments of, 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 um, of agricultural subsidies to Britain's 100,000 farmers. That was £450 million, £450 million that was scrapped um, to, pay, to, to process small payments to 100,000 farmers. There are many, many, many examples in a kind of burgeoning literature in this area. We decided we'd kind of had enough. I, I, I think he probably, George Osborne, probably wanted, wanted a kind of Cambridge platform, an academic from a Cambridge platform. I certainly wanted to raise the, the sort of open agenda back then and to start to investigate its possibilities. What was interesting for me is it catapulted me into a kind of uh, an interesting adventure, if you like, of uh, close involvement with helping to shape the, the open agenda in the, in the technology space in the UK. So then um, the procurement part of the Tories Technology Manifesto was, was my stuff. I then wrote a... a, a um, a white paper with the current CTO, Liam Maxwell, um, around uh, that was basically used, if you like, as a playbook for uh, the Cabinet <coughs> Office's um, um, uh, efficiency and reform group under Francis Maud. So basically what they did is call in a lot of the big suppliers, say, this can't go on any longer. Um, we're going we're to enter a new phase now where we're going to try and, try, and, try and separate out, if you like, the kind of expensive <coughs> stuff that you're doing from the non-expensive stuff that you're doing. We're not going to pay you for bespoke suits when we can pay you for off-the-peg suits, effectively. But also to start about to think about designing more open platforms for delivery of public services in the future. And I produced, I think, with, with this chap, Joe Fishenden, uh, what I think is still the only um, academic paper um, directly um, addressing um, open architectures uh, in the public sector, which in fact was, um, was a, I guess there's a link to, to here because it was um, it built directly on, on Helen Margetts and Patrick Dunleavy's prior article in the Journal of Public Administration Research and Theory. So it was published in the same, art same, same journal um, and it tries to update, if you like, or offer um, a, a kind of 
uh, and, and updating of some of those some of those arguments. And anyway, I won't go into all of these, but there has been um, I've, I've I've had a lot of fun. It's been a bit of a kind of roller coaster ride, um, and um, and I've, I've been a cabinet office advisor helping to shape quite a few of the components of, of of the government's approach at the moment. What I just wanted to do, and critically, because I think this this explains um, a a kind of nebulous but highly highly important concept, is. Um, to dive into two very small blogs, um, I've basically got a, I've got a five series um, article of blogs in Computer Weekly at the moment. Um, the, the most recent one came out, I think, um, yesterday. And, and what we tried to do is to explain to a generalised audience what open standards really can do for, for public services. So I'm just going to kind of um, uh, try and just dip into that um, quickly here. So, and I'm going, to, I'm going to read it out to you, but please, please follow along the screen as well. And I'm going to read out sort of bits of it. And it, it adopts a deliberately simplistic tone. So it says, once upon a time in a parallel but somehow strangely familiar world, there was a street of very ordinary looking shops. <coughs> Shopkeepers provided very important services for the local people and were dedicated and do good at their jobs. We're talking about the public sector. However, the street had a problem. To see the problem, you need to step behind the counters into the back rooms of the shops, which had all these old electrical appliances humming, buzzing and clanking away. Shopkeepers were totally reliant on their appliances, which did all sorts of important things. Taking a closer look, they were even more astonished. Each of the appliances in each of the shops was entirely different, although they were doing all of the same things. But instead of getting together to pool their best inventions, a great many of the shopkeepers liked working this way. were all special, they purred contentedly to themselves. The big problem with each of these things was consuming enormous and ever-growing amounts of time and money. The point we're trying to present here is that, let's take local government, we have 360 to 400 uh, organisations up and down the UK, and let's face it, these are the, the touch points that most people, citizens in this country, have with government, all doing precisely the same thing in vehemently different ways that are, that are not necessarily around providing the best public services. So more and more wires, custom-made parts, flanges, meters, sprockets, other paraphernalia have been bolted on over the years, okay? And it was very, very amateur, but it was, it was far less risky to leave it well alone, okay? And then we talked about um, the outsourcing phenomenon. So, so enter, if you like, many of the kind of armies of consultants and systems integrators who have, co which, who have absolutely conspired with senior public sector officials to keep things in this exactly the same way. So... Outside each shop was a van, some painted red, blue, others green for the different companies. Several shops had the same colour vans, but rather than try and keep their intimidatingly sprawling inventions running themselves, most shopkeepers in the street have started to ask the van people to look after them. And, and the van people said, all your stuff is a frightful mess, it's special, complicated and unstable, we only bother investing in this stuff if we can maintain it for you for at least 10 years and make a lot of money. Shopkeepers didn't like being talked to like that by the van people, but they weren't in a position to argue. And then we talk about the shared services phenomenon, and I don't want to dwell too much on this because I really want to explain open platforms. But, but the problem is we go through the idea that people start to share services, um, and, then, and then the problem is, of course, Shop A says, we'd like to talk to you about sharing our inventions so we can split the cost. Shop B says, fantastic, you could share my inventions, you can share my services. But of course, nobody wants to share anybody else's services because we're talking about collapse of organisational back office structures and all the interests enshrined in that. So all sorts of people didn't want things to change. Shopkeepers could blame everything on the van people. Van people could blame the shopkeepers. Everyone could blame the inventions. Shopkeepers are comfortable managing the van people to maintain their shops rather than doing it themselves. Van people have grown fat on this special model, selling slightly different versions of the same thing again and again in order to carry on. Some shopkeepers even picked up plum jobs with the van people for helping to make them so fat. Okay, so we're, we're kind of critical about this. It's had, it was been reasonably uh, well received. Then people start talking about um, uh, open platforms, and that's what I wanted to explain to you here before we jump back in. So open platforms. Here we go. So, in contrast to the public sector that we're talking about in the street, in Market City, sorry, excuse the cheesy, cheesy um, characterization, everyone was busy talking to their customers, listening to them, um, and there are very few people worrying about how to manage all these things, okay, so they could spend their time on their customers. They tried out the idea of building just one standard and cheap version of each thing, each service, so all shops could share them, but it hadn't worked because, of course, one size doesn't fit all. People need to be locally appropriate, of course, and participatory. So you can't just award some mega contract to one systems integrator or one service outsourcer to provide a service because, because again, you get the same problems writ all over again. Okay? So, what they really wanted were things that they could use, local services, and adapt locally to meet customers' needs, but were also cheap. Okay? And then they hit on the big idea, and this is the big idea. 
Several people got together, took their appliances apart and laid them out into groups of standard components. And they said from henceforth we will assemble our own local appliances using standard components conforming to open standards so we can choose and swap between components whenever we want to. Although the components were small, because all the shopkeepers had banded together to pool their demand, there was good money to be made in designing and making them. Here you get the innovation, the link between platforms of standard requirements, okay, and the incentive of people to innovate and produce things that run on those platforms. All sorts of small companies that have been far too small to build and maintain entire appliances now competed with one another to sell the shopkeepers ever new and more innovative components. And they all work together beautifully. And shopkeepers could assemble their own local appliances and choose which components and suppliers to use. The big idea worked, and here's the critical piece. The big idea worked because Open Standards created a common platform that allowed shopkeepers to have their cake and eat it. Cheap, locally tailored appliances, which are easy to assemble and run, with a crowd of suppliers vying with one another to think of ever cleverer, more innovative ideas to make them even better. The platform wasn't just the technology, though. Remember, they had not succeeded in creating enough demand for a standard one-size appliance. The reason the platform took off was because of demand for components. So part of the, yes, technical standards can form part of a platform, but actually what really makes that platform fly is, is, is the demand that standardising creates. Okay, so what we're saying here is at the moment we have a public sector across the world, although there are some uh, emerging exemplars from other countries as well, which is focused on inputs, on technology, okay, and on commissioning. So in other words, we have, let's say we, have, let's say we run Oracle, the database Oracle, well, we, we know we run Oracle, we're fixated on that, so therefore there's only one product we can buy. Oracle know that, so they, they, the commercial boot is on their foot, if you like. They'll only treat with us if we lock into them for a 10-year outsourcing contract, maybe. In return, we have to customise our own business processes, service outcomes, and our own technological <coughs> standards to fit Oracle. Okay? And this is, we're seeing this up and down the country at a cost of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not billions, tens of billions of pounds. And what we're saying is the journey for, for, for UK public sector or public services is long one. It's, it's 10, 15, 20 years time. It's about moving from this side here, the current situation, to a future state where government says we will do common business processes in a particular common way. Okay, so standards, components of executable business logic, if you like. We're going to do these things in a, in a particular way and, we're going to, and it's going to result in these, these particular service outcomes and it's got to conform to these high-level standards. And then we don't care who you are, and we don't care what technology you use. The technology vanishes. Okay? And we're probably going to go to rental, rental models. Rather than buying shrink wrap or locking ourselves in for 10-year outsourcing deals, we'll just rent stuff. Okay? And, and increasingly, we're starting to see the beginnings of some of that stuff. Think about Microsoft 365 and OpenOffice, for example. So there's a massive transition in terms of business logic, in terms of supporting technology, and in terms of uh, the commercials for this. But, it's, but, but that's pretty much the hub of it. And we are in the opposite position from the way uh, the globalised technology markets are pushing us. One of the kind of clo classic poster children for this is, of course, Google. You know, why is it that we use all these things? We're familiar with these ideas with our domestic technology, but as soon as we come to work, uh, we leave all of that behind and we're happy to, 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 to use all this rubbish. Uh, the point is about Google, of course, is that it's a technology platform. Android is an open platform, okay? But, it, but the platform is partly the, the technology's openness, but it's partly the massive amount of eyeballs that, of course, look at Google. And because of that traffic, that demand, all sorts of characters are incentivized to invest in that platform, okay? Whether it's mashup creators or software engineers or advertising companies, or they all participate in the platform Okay, because of the demand, which is facilitated by open standards. Okay, and what is really happening here, of course, is that when you've got one of something, of course, it's innovative, it's highly risky, it's expensive, it's unproven. Okay, that's the kind of DIY approach to delivering public services, okay, where everybody is special, everybody does their own thing. As you build some more of those things out, of course, more suppliers enter the market. Think about electricity. Very, very similar. And of course, over time, as the product becomes built out, established, it becomes ubiquitous, it's cheaper, and that demand spurs people to plunge in, pile into that market, if you like, and develop um, innovations that run on that platform. The only reason, of course, that I, can, uh, that I can go to John Lewis and buy myself an electrical product very quickly and a toaster that plugs in is because I'm happy to run it on whatever the 240 volts that, that, that the UK runs on. If I want to have a house that runs on 368.5 <coughs> volts, 
I've got to build all my own appliances. And that's pretty much what the public sector has been doing. So what we did is we say, look, for government, you have to take this into account and think about where you're, where you're paying bespoke prices for what ought to be bargain basement stuff. And if you can collect those standard, standard business components together across the state, you will save billions and billions of pounds. And more importantly, maybe, you can start to think about uh, clustering services around the citizen a little bit more too. So here's a kind of piece of futurology to finish this, this piece. For example, take local government and social care. At the moment, many of the much social care is outsourced. Much of it is contained within workflow technologies. And if I'm, if I'm running social care for, for a local, uh, local government organisation, I've got very little understanding of how that, how that, what goes on inside that black box at all. In a future, um, a future componentized world, again, building on this model here, this distinction between utility and commodity, we may well see uh, a world where, for example, some of these components, payments, cash receipts, all this standard stuff is out in the cloud. That will be a utility, and we won't pay for that stuff anymore. All we've got to do is to assemble those building blocks to provide our own services ourselves. We won't pay for that. We will, we will probably club together with, with, with other um, uh, people in our vertical, so other, other, other um, um, local government organisations for some of those components, for example, customer databases or case management, because they will never be, there will never be enough demand to make them into a utility. Okay? So we're going we're to share services there, but this stuff will be free, I should think, on the cloud. And then only where we can show that, if you like, we're not making our own electricity. You know, government doesn't, doesn't build its own electricity and it doesn't have any business making its own electricity like that. Only when we can show we're not repeating, if you like, giving, giving jobs, to the, jobs to the boys, okay, do we actually uh, provide those kind of face-to-face -face services within the public domain. And by the way, this isn't an argument for wholesale transition of resource away from the public sector, far from it. Okay? The argument is that you can ring fence far greater resources for people who are actually delivering frontline services. Double, triple, quadruple them. Stop paying them to large service outsourcing companies okay, who take that wealth away from public services um, and, and actually open that up. So again, we could we could we could kind of dive into that in a bit more detail later. But uh, so another another kind of way of conceptualising it is the kind of magnets and iron filings. At the moment, what's happened is we've had government departments um, clustering the iron filings of the government departments and agencies clustering around technology service providers and large outsourcing companies buying again and again and again and again slightly different versions of the same thing. I submit, potentially, there is a lesson here for development organisations. We'll come to that directly in a minute. What we've got to do is to disintegrate some of those vertical structures that can be re-aggregated again in the form of these components around individuals. Okay, so we can start to see some kind of open, open um, uh, implications here. And I believe, ultimately, what this means is a gradual disintegration of the vertical state and vertical public services. I genuinely believe that there are moves afoot to build horizontal platforms over the next 5, 10, 15 years, which will ultimately disintegrate the, the kind of repetition of back office functions across our public service estate, which will provide um, all sorts of implications for civil service reform um, and also the structuring of state service provision itself. So I think there are some very, very radical things afoot, and I think that most people are only beginning to wake up to quite how radical this is. Um, and if this, is re if this is restructuring many organisations in the private sector, if this is about to restructure the shape, future shape of service delivery in the UK, why on earth should, develop for, should the developmental uh, community be immune from some of what is going on here? But there will be a lot of blood on the tracks because, of course, if we're talking about the deverticalization of anybody's world, there are, there are winners and there are losers. And the losers are people in, the, whether it's HSBC or HMRC, the losers are the people who, who are currently protected by those highly duplicatory, um, vertically integrated structures. I tried to explain in a model to the Cabinet Office how this is going to work, so that if, if, if some of these um, delivery models came about, you needed to have culture change, you needed to have a, a focus on services, you had to have transparency, and then moving down the stack to some of the more technologically um, oriented uh, ideas. I'm not going to dwell on them, but, but look at this. This is, what they, this is what they did with it. This sits in the, in the front of the Cabinet Office Strategic Implementation Plan, published in November 2011. Here, culture change from delivery to commissioning was watered down to innovative ways of working and strengthened governance. It's not the same thing. That's not what I was talking about. Service-driven procurement models and practices became watered down to 
commercial models and practices. I didn't say that. I said service-driven uh, service models and practices. So, so you know, um, Sir Humphrey's hackles are up, and, and I think there will be a long time, uh, not naive at all, before, uh, before some of these things are achieved. Um, and there is, there is an enormous, there is enormous kind of uh, debate about the role of the center. Okay, so for example, in Google, somebody needed to build the platform. Somebody needed to pull together some of those kind of convergent paths um, to start to build an ecosystem. Who is it that starts to do that? Will it happen by itself? There are some very important questions. Um, I castigated the government in a report to the PASC committee um, uh, a couple of years ago. But the great thing is we got the PASC committee to, to the parliamentary <coughs> committee to call government IT a recipe for ripoffs, which is fantastic because this, this at the time was, was fairly explosive stuff. There are a whole bunch of questions about how we can catalyze these things and other barriers as well. Education. Most people have no idea what we're talking about here in this room. Okay, despite the fact it's happening underneath their eyes and restructuring their organizational realities, there is very, very little engagement with that. And there is, of course, a deeply entrenched fondness for being different. We're different here, we do things differently, it's, oh, it's not appropriate here. Well, in many cases it is, but it's about cultural change rather than the kind of technical stuff. If implemented correctly, the technology will disappear. Uh, final slide on this. Um, this is the kind of uh, the current state of where the government is at. I've become a bit more of a kind of critical friend, I think, rather than a, an insider. We've got government digital service, which is trying to uh, adopt, or sorry, to identify the top grossing transactions within government, to collect those across government and to digitize them. Those, those things alone will, will cause chaos in some of the traditional departmental <laughs> structures. GDS is a very net savvy, um, uh, as you can see from their website, lots of kind of streaming stuff and, and web roles and blog roles and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and this chap, Francis Maud, absolutely gets it. But the thing is, he's only going to be here for another, another couple of years, I guess. I, don't know, I'm not a, I haven't got a crystal ball. But, but this is a long-term thing. This is about restructuring um, much of the UK economy, whether it's public sector or private sector, and it very much needs a, people with a bit more of a strategic focus. And as well, it needs people, academics, who can critique some of this from a political economy perspective as well. So um, I think there are, I think there is, we're beginning to see people talk about GAP, government as a platform. Okay, I think we can expect to hear more about that stuff. It's not going away. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, and finally, yes, finally for this, it uh, might be worth looking up for people who find this stuff interesting. GDS have come up with some design principles. And again, I think there's a real, there's a real, um, and, and, and it's bizarre because they're coming at it from different sides of the planet, but there is a real alignment between Robert Chambers and adaptive pluralism that we've discussed already and the government design principles, GDS design principles. In particular, be consistent, not uniform. In other words, rather than make everything the same, yeah, actually it's, it's about having some very, very parsimonious principles um, which can underlie different diverse implementations based on those, those kind of open standards, if you like, those, those parsimonious principles. And I think some of those things are, are fascinating. And they explain on the website, the GDS website, what each of them, they go through each of those as well. Again, the, the, the notion of open and inclusivity um, and, and, and user generation shines through very, very clearly. Okay, so I just want to quickly wrap up with some observations, I think, for, for the development community that come out of what I've been talking about in terms of open architectures, okay? And hopefully to, to kind of suggest that there are other things that we can do as students of ICT for D, as well as to track and follow those fantastic kind of Web2 um, instances that I, that I kind of provided a flavor of a little bit earlier, okay? And I'm going to call it kind of slightly contentiously um, development as a platform, DAP, for open development, okay? So I think there, are, there is work to do, clearly. So if we look at the, the subject um, in terms of, in terms of uh, a kind of uh, poor and, and state relations, um, I quite like the way that Stuart Corbridge uh, characterized quite a lot of that as, as you know, the poor person meeting, and obviously there's a bit of an African bias here, um, particularly government offices or conventions, is often as in the form of intermediaries, okay, and often kind of you know, rent-seeking uh, intermediaries. Uh, there have been, uh, obviously, Scott highlighted the kind of the, the the, the underlying kind of threat of violence that underpins uh, the high modernist state. Um, and then we've had these very, very colourful um, uh, characterization, different characterizations of, of uh, primarily uh, African states. Um, the balloon state, for example, hovering um, a kind of, you know, a capitalist orientated cumulative state, hovering and unable to articulate uh, with a, a, pr a primarily rural economy. Um, you've got, um, oh, I don't know, you've got um, uh, the, uh, the Ghanaian vampire state, um, 
Uh, anyway, uh, all sorts of all sorts of quite colourful problematizations, in particular the African state and its in, its inability, if you like, to to articulate on a kind of one to one basis, or no, put, put it another way, particular characterizations of um, of of. Uh, developmental states' relationships with poor people, I think is probably the most accurate way to describe some of those. So I guess I'm mapping out that territory as highly, in the context of what I've been talking about, right for some of the things that we've been talking about. Take, for example, the observation that digital transactions cost 50 times less than face-to-face -face transactions. I personally don't believe that, that, um, uh, that developing economy states um, characterized by these sorts of um, um, epithets will be any more able to resist some of the kind of uh, market economics uh, of this stuff than the UK state is able to do. We can't afford it anymore. I, I'd be surprised if other people find that they can. So if, if, if leaving aside ideology and, and transformational developmental aspirations for a second, there's some pure economics here as well, which is going to help to drive these things drive these things out. So, so I kind of want to wrap up with four types, of, four types of questions I think we can ask ourselves. I think as we see some of these transitions, there is a need absolutely for political economy, who wins and who loses. I'll talk a little bit about that. I think there's a need to focus strategically on design. So um, development as a platform and development of services. And I think it's about business models and architecture. Some of that kind of harder stuff that some of us working in development aren't necessarily used to engaging directly with. I think there's absolutely a need to measure the qualitative engagement that that's going to produce the developmental experience, if you like, for people who are, who are unfortunate enough in many cases to be developed, um, and, and sorry, to be being developed or undergoing development, and finally some, some directions for research. Um, if, it's if it's disruptive and it's transformatory, then I think there's absolutely every need to measure the winners and the losers here, if you like. And I think, as, as Matt Smith talks about, and we're collaborating on a book at the moment, um, on, um, on looking at models of open development, it's a it's a it's a um, uh, um, it's an edited book um, that that they challenge contemporary models of production and <coughs> control. Just as in the UK state uh, uh, scenario with with the panoply of private sector organisations, very very deep linkages with the top of the public sector, um, and indeed revolving doors in many cases. We have an architecture of power and control here, and I think we need to engage properly with the implications of what we're talking about. I think at a more prosaic level, there are the, the who controls the platforms. We've already seen early scuffles in, in Africa, for example, with new independent internet service providers um, uh, clashing with, with, with state-owned um, distribution networks, etc. And we're going to see a lot more of that kind of stuff as well. And again, I think for me, the development gateway is a reminder that these things are important and that they won't go quietly. I think, uh, so, we, we um, uh, Matt Smith, um, uh, and, um, and Riley um, uh, and myself put together a, um, an IFIP 9.4 um, uh, uh, conference um, call for papers. This is, this is something on open development. And it's quite telling, actually, in terms of how bleeding edge some of this stuff is, that we've only had three submissions and we're actually going to cancel the track. Okay? And these are the questions that we put out, again, on, on the governance side. So how and in what context do different open systems bring about developmental benefits? When and how might openness undermine developmental aims and reinforce existing power symmetries, etc.? So there's a whole bunch of those questions about winners and losers that I think remain ready to be answered. Moving on to design, I think there's a whole bunch of really quite pragmatic questions about development organisations and how they conceive of themselves and their own business models and their own architectures, which can be learned directly from other public service delivery context, specifically in my case, the UK. There are all sorts of lessons overcoming that we're special. People don't understand architecture. They don't understand if you can split your services into different components, then you've got to understand how those things work. You've got to be able to draw them out. You've got to be able to understand the model. Um, you've got to be able to build a constituency of contributors, not just consumers. One might argue that and I'm, I'm guilty as anybody. Here, here I am with my iPad or my, my um, I, whatever it's called, notebook. I'm an Apple consumer. I'm kind of in love with that technology. Unfortunately, Apple has locked us out of, of being producers. Of course, we're consumers of those technologies because Apple is a closed platform. Um, how, do you, how do you build people who can actually build this, uh, so get together or, or build capabilities to contribute and to produce rather than to consume? How do you engender startup attitudes? This is all very startup-y, okay? Um, how do you do that? How, how do you go against 
many, many years, uh, entrenched power structures of top-down, vertically integrated, kind of representationist uh, viewpoints. There are some digital skills gaps. Um, there, are, there is, there is the, you know, some, some specialist concepts. Minimum viable product. Only build what you need. Build a few standard building blocks and make those openly available to all sorts of people. You need a digital strategy. You need to understand what the verticalization will do to your mandate. In other words, quite simply, just like public services, in a world where, where citizens are consuming and making things more for themselves, then actually um, uh, some of the mandate, the traditional state mandate, to do all that stuff starts to go away. So people need to think about that. It is threatening. And finally, there's some stuff around open standards as well. Um, so, so I think the, the, the most important thing on the design front is about the business model. It's not about the technology. This stuff will encourage people to think differently about what they are there to do and how they design their <laughs> services around the notion of open, okay, to be more participative. So people need to engage with this stuff at the policy level when designing interventions and services, not just post hoc when they look at Google, okay, because this stuff can apply to everybody. Um, okay, last, last, last few slides and we'll wrap up. I think there's, there's an important need to look at engagement. That's the third dimension of questions. Okay, you remember the adaptive pluralism stuff? I think there are people who are thinking about that. Um, and I think there think are people who are thinking that, de that development and achieving adaptive pluralism is increasingly about opening up spaces for social and institutional change. And understanding how those spaces are created and opened will help us to be a lot more adaptively plural. Okay, and there is some early evidence, um, field evidence, of ICT's role in this. So, for example, um, some, some field evidence from Rajasthan saying actually that creating these spaces, okay, is, is very much, a, 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 has been very much facilitated by enabling mechanism, channels for information flow and convergence, for for debate, platforms for decision making, and that these are essential. So there is some early call and justification to take this stuff very, very seriously. Um, I think there is somebody, somebody who, who I'm also working with is working on this, this book as well. Um, Enika Buskins, anybody, I think some of you may be familiar with, with her work. She produced a book a couple of years ago about women um, and ICT for D. She's probably the sort of, ex the, she is the expert on um, ICT for D and, and gender relations, certainly in an African context. She runs um, about 64 research programs up and down Africa. Uh, and she's, she's very, very focused on the notion of intent. And... Um, it's quite, quite wacky, quite out there, but in summary, I think what she's saying is if you can open up some of those emergent spaces specifically and engage w in, your, in your kind of interactions with that desire, then you stand more of a, a, a chance of aligning people's individual intents and motivations and whole person capabilities with what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, and so, so rather than people trying to get themselves into the frame of mind of something they've been told by somebody else, by opening up these spaces, you can harness a whole load more energy and effectiveness. Um, and, and she's working very hard on that. If that sounds woolly, have a look at the book, because it's, uh, she's, she's really kind of out there at the frontier of thinking about some of the philosophical and methodological implications of this. For me, I think, and my next slide talks about my own... My, my own Sorry, Mike, because <coughs> I see that the time for question is, is shrinking. 30 not, seconds. Right, 30 seconds. 60 and seconds. 60 right. seconds. Um, uh, so, Lucy Suchman... For me, emergence is, is most eloquently defined in her book, Plans and Situated Actions. Um, it's a fantastic book. It talks about Polynesian navigators, um, and she talks about the way in which they're frequently only on acting in a present situation that its possibilities become clear. We don't know that ahead of time, at least not with any specificity. It's a fantastic book, particularly about um, ICT uh, and its relationship to openness. So my, my, my research question is probably drawing all this stuff together. To what extent do open platforms, and I've described hopefully um, some of those in terms of some of the architectures of openness, support access to ubiquitous products and services, so that's development as a service, if you like, that creates space for this adaptive plural developmental agency, and how might this potential be occupied, uh, optimized? And I think there's some, there's some hard stuff, and I've talked a little bit about some of those, the business architecture, the business models, the architecture, and the, the platform economics. But then there's also a whole load of very, very vibrant organizational theory around practice and emergence that we can also look at to see how effective we are. This is my final slide. So um, I think there are all sorts of other ways to get involved. That happens to be my own, my, uh, my own interest. But I think there are, there are parallels between the UK and other experiences and the development community. I think there is a real need for a political economy of development 2.0 in terms of building out those ideas and the implications of those. I think there is 
a real need to move beyond the mashup. And what I'm talking about there is, yes, it's very important to look at and to document these case studies of, 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 um, of peer-to-peer -peer interaction, but somebody needs to engage with the bigger picture as well, with, with some of that architecture, and that's what I've tried to, to do today. So I think that's, that's an area that nobody is really looking at at all yet. I think there's a need to revisit the, the formal developmental delivery model in the light of what we've been talking about, um, and I think people will start to do that. There's a need to critique the ability of open platforms to support this adaptive pluralism, okay, and, and, and in particular to let the baddies in as well as the goodies. Okay, so so I'm, I, you know, I don't want to be too optimistic about it. Um, and I think there's a central role for open standards, but where's the centre? Who's going who's gonna to produce that? And of course, finally, let's not forget, this is the Nokia 1100. What is the most used feature in this, in this phone, of which there are 500 million in Africa? SMS. SMS. Voice. It's the torch. Uh, so access, access, access will never go away, and, and I think particularly as ICT for D is, we must never forget um, the, some, some of the kind of local circumstances in which we're operating. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>